this program, we'll travel with the slingshot transport truck that has been nicknamed Tinkerbell. We'll look at an ever-growing collection of Mack trucks in central Queensland, now housed in a museum-style building and is perhaps the biggest collection of beautifully restored vintage bulldogs in the Southern Hemisphere. We'll go back into history and hear about the old times of trucks and mining at Mount Morgan. And we'll spear straight from history to the present day and drive halfway across the country in a new cat truck with a road train rating. I'm Bruce Honeywell. I write, I drive trucks, I make films. You meet up with mates in strange places in this trucking game. Earl Dunder is a fly speck on the map, a roadhouse on the Old South Road or the Stewart Highway. And that's where this story begins. It's always good to catch up with an old mate. Seat stiff and bandy legged, Lindsay Davies climbs down from the cab. We've been mates a long time, him and me. Doesn't matter how we ended up in a place like Earl Dunder at the same time, but these things happen. 16 ton of salt that come from Price in South Australia. There's two gyrocopters that I picked up at Downing's place in Jamestown. And there's three bags of spuds, two bags of onions for a mate of mine. And we've got a tyre changer up the top so the boys don't have to bust their guts. And down the back they've got a new shed for the kids to put up on the station. And the two dongers down the back are for the gas plant in Darwin. And it's on to the road. Alice Springs is the best part of three hours away with a truck speed limited to 90 clicks. The shadows from the Desert Oaks lengthen across the highway. The desert can be a beautiful place and these Desert Oaks can be its crowning glory. The dongers on Lindsay's trailers bound for Darwin are over with, so the Western Star has allowed daylight travelling only. Lindsay's hooking in, wanting to make Alice Springs and out through the hills on the north side of town before dark. The Western Star Constellation has a CAT C15, rated at 550 horsepower. It drives through an 18 speed to four 1-1s. It is said that the Fink River is the oldest flowing river in the world. Once it ran wide and wild with snow melt from a mountain range taller than the Himalayas. Some time ago I had a chance to travel down and take a look at this river. Cattle stations cling to its banks, surviving on the water that is often beneath the sand. Stations like Horseshoe Bend. Big areas eking out an existence from the desert. Flying down the river, you sense its former glory. Can imagine it cutting its way through the landscape to some great inland sea in Gondwana land. Today, it floods out in the Simpson Desert. Those great snow-capped ranges have eroded down to the beautiful McDonald Ranges of today. And now it's rare to see the Fink flow. And as we cross this old river, it's dry. And there's the monument built to remember four deaths that occurred here during the first and only Northern Territory cannonball run. In 1994, with the support of the then Territory Government, the folly of a road race was set up from Darwin to Uluru and return. Tragedy crashed the event when an out-of-control Ferrari driven by a Japanese team plunged into a checkpoint here, killing two race officials and the car's driver navigation team. After the tragedy, a 150 kilometres an hour limit was put on the race and there are many stories of locals overtaking the race competitors as at that time there was no speed limit on the open highway in the Territory. Lindsay swings into Bonning cattle yards where IOR has a fuel depot. A 
1,100 litres of diesel go into the tanks. That's 1,100 litres to travel 1,200 kilometres. Not too bad for a triple road train. The Western Star might be grossing only 90 tonnes, but the dongers are pushing a brick wall of air. Alice Springs in the afternoon. The McDonald's cook gently through the winter day. All vehicular traffic heading north to Darwin or south to Adelaide has to come through Heavy Tree Gap. Through Alice Springs, Lindsay heads through the hills, heading north in the last light of day. A decent pullout must be found for the night where the truck and trailers will be safe, ready to leave at first light in the morning. The night camp is at the pullout near the monument. The place that marks the highest point on the Stewart Highway, 2,300 feet above sea level. I've got to pull up here because it's dark. Not allowed to travel in the dark. You've got to get going at daylight. Over right. with. Roll up the swag. Yeah, roll, no, no, I'll sleep in the swag. You're near too cold outside. Proper soft fella. How you going? Bit stiff? Bit stiff, bit sore, but. You haven't been tempted to get in these things, eh? No, thank you. That one's a twin-seater, but I won't be getting in it. Because all I've heard is gyrocopters, people's name ends up being spot on the ground. Now, rail carting trails, it's been modified back to a triaxle, but extremely high for a bloke like me putting these on, I just make it. That'll do. It might seem a little cruel, but I spend the night in a bed in Alice Springs. But I was out at the truck before daylight and Lindsay fires the old girl up. The thermometer on my hire car reckons it's one degree. It's a bit chilly, all right. I've got me thongs on, I've got me Darwin clobber. And so, with air pumped up, we head north once more. Bird Plain is rich cattle country on Yamba Station. Like much of Australia, there is a huge mining tenement on this magnificent country where Western Desert Resources are searching for rare earth minerals. I grab a couple of photos at the turn-in for Adleron Roadhouse. Well, I do have a magazine to fill. After a good brekkie, Lindsay checks the load and trailers and climbs into the saddle once more. The pull towards Native Gap slowed trucks down once, but not any more with a cat purring up the hill. Past Central Mouse Stewart. Here, we're in the dead heart of our beautiful continent. This is the heart. A little further on is a lonely stone memorial. This is the Teamsters Memorial Week. Charlie Chambers lost his life in 1871. He was on the survey party for the OT line, which they built a, was only a few years after John McGill Stewart surveyed the way through. And he was probably the first transport operator to die in the Northern Territory. So.
It's road transport. That, that's the glue that holds the territory together, eh? And we've lost a few. We've lost plenty lost over the years. Yeah, we sure have. You yeah, forget but... about them, but they're all there. You can see their crosses all over the territory. Lost in thought of those who have died on Territory Roads, Lindsay pulls back out onto the Stewart Highway. Up the Barra Creek jump up, where in the old days, drivers used to read half a novel between the bottom and the top, pulling seven trailers to Tennant Creek. Through the tiny historic village of Barra Creek, Many of these centres were set up for the building of the Overland Telegraph Line, a technological advance as big as the internet at the time. With the coming of the OT line, Australia was in touch with Britain in minutes or an hour or so, rather than months by mail carried on ships. Time is getting closer, I'll have to leave my old mate and I have to punch ahead to Darwin. But first, time for a decent feed at walk up. Check the load and trailers. Tighten an odd chain. and a fairly impressive walk-up mixed grill. Nothing in the bush can't be improved with a bit of dead horse. Time to part and Lindsay heads out into the glare of the afternoon. I have places to be, people to see. Coming up in central Queensland, we look at what probably is the biggest collection of vintage Mack trucks in the southern hemisphere. Owned by Andil Ranger and subcontracted to Main Nicholas. Rockhampton is the major city in central Queensland. It claims to be the beef capital of Australia, the world even. Today, it's a mining centre and a pastoral hub with sale yards nearby and a meatworks. Here a bloke called Tony Champion calls the place home. Tony turns up in the magazines and media showing off his trucks at every dogfight in Eastern Australia. And dogfight it could be, every one of Tony Champion's trucks has a dog on the bonnet. But Tony has just opened a brand spanking new building to house and exhibit his loves. I went there with Truck and Life's heritage writer, Barry Harmsworth. So what's going on here Tony? You've got the collection together at last. Yeah, well, we're finally, uh, finally in the new shed here, Barry. Uh, we've had a, a lot of these things have been scattered all over the main workshop for the last three or four years, but um, this is a purpose-built uh, building to put all these old Macs together, and it's nice to see them in here uh, with no dust on them. After some of them have been here a month now, they look nice and clean. None of the old British trucks around here? No, well, I guess that started... Uh, when I should have been at school, I was uh, learning to change gears in a Mac from the passenger seat. <laughs> and, uh, and that was in the timber industry in Tasmania. I bought an R700 to haul our equipment around with, and then uh, that led to a first new superliner back in uh, 1982. And then uh, 25 years in the mining industry, mm. um, someone said, 
What are you going to do? Sit on the beach? I said, No, I'm going to. Over. I'll go over to the coast and restore a B model. Restore <laughs> one. And that's how it started. Just, yeah. just, just one B model we had. And the purpose of uh, the, the Mac collection, uh, well, initially, as I said, it was for uh, for B models. Mm, which exactly. They, they were the backbone of Australia. But then I saw there was a. Uh, I got interested in some models that no one had ever seen. Only pictures of them. I exactly. Thought. Yeah. They're yeah. in our reach, and we've had a lot of things in our favour, actually. Mm. Um, Aussie dollar's good for mm. importing. <laughs> Chain drive? Well, quite simple, actually. Instead of the differential and uh, rear axle being right at the back, uh, as you can see there, the, uh, that's the differential and axle lever with a sprocket on it. And, and it's, a, uh, it's a light uh, back axle, just as, as a solid steel bar. Mm. And, um, one of the advantages that I'm told is that they could change the ratio beside the road to get up a big hill. This truck's left-hand drive. This is a, this is a replica of the two trucks that came to Australia. Uh, and, but this truck is right down to the number plate. Original replica as a truck. That's right, Barry, you were you, here the day this came. Yeah. And, uh, and the reason that we got that truck is because they didn't think in America it could be brought back, yeah. so just that made us all the more determined. Yeah. And uh, yeah, no, so uh, we, we did. We just, did. Yeah, that's right. Just there were days when we wondered what we had done, but when yeah. you see it there like that, it's uh, that's been well worthwhile. And consequently, now we have something that uh, is unique. The only one left in the world. That's right. Yep. It is unique. Uh, there was only two bogey drive B60 runs that I know of that came to this country, and Andy Ranger had both of them. Uh, Ken Archer had a integrated sleeper with a single drive, and he subject to Andrew Ranger as well. But uh, this, uh, this this particular truck uh, was uh, operated by Barry Sky and Bill Walsh um, for Andrew Ranger, and you see their names on the on the fuel tank there. Yeah, legendary drivers. They certainly were. I've noticed you got one of the bicentennials here. And um, it's the Kingsford Smith. Kingsford Smith, yeah, one of 16. Uh, become an icon now. Mm. Um, probably Australia's most collectible truck, I guess, for bicentennial. Definitely. Um, and as you can see, when they're polished and washed and, and sitting here under the lights, so mm. they are magnificent. They yeah. still are magnificent. Yeah. First, um, first Australian truck to have cruise control. Mm. First Australian truck to have um, uh, television in the cab sleeper. Mm. They, they came standard with a refrigerator. And in '88, that that was a pretty special truck. Yeah, if you yeah. if you if you had the privilege of driving one of these, your chance to do a customised truck as opposed to an exact reproduction is normal. After all the years of looking for. Uh, Glass lenses for clearance lights, uh, colour matches, uh, the correct bonnet latches, virtually every nut and bolt original in a B61. Uh, we decided we'd let our hair down and we'd, we'd make a Mack truck for ourselves. And that's what we've done here. It's just magnificent in the sun. Uh, th this, this particular truck, we've put a airbag Hendrickson under the back. Uh, it's got a Peterbilt sleeper. We've got a 18 speed Eaton. It's got a 865 V8 and an Iveco front axle to give it the extra width. We widened the mud guards and completely customised the dash. It's 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 a beautiful thing. Look looks good and drives good and. Uh, we, we look forward to uh, heading up the road in Seduce. Not far from Rockhampton is Mount Morgan. Many older truckies will remember carting loads of copper dust from Warrigo Mine near Tennant Creek to here back in the day. Now Ken Reeve is no ordinary fella. Retired now, he has many interests, like his train set that grew into a house-eating monster. 
Ken Reid spent 32 years working at Mount Morgan Mine. He's an active historian of those days and has some rare archival footage of life in the mine. Ken takes heritage writer Barry Harmsworth and me out to the mine to chat about the old days. It's hard to take in here with the pit full of water, the life that used to go on. I asked Ken, where are we standing? It used to be the cyanide mixing plant for the... They mixed the cyanide in the, in the tanks here and there was... Down on the, in the cut here, there's a concrete pad where there's three big tanks and then it, it'd go down to there, into these tanks, and they'd be fed into the, into the main plant. Cyanide. Mm. Poisonous. Mm. And we're standing in it. No, I think it'd be gone by now. <laughs> Ken Reid formed a special relationship with a truck that he called the Bomber. Oh, it was a good old truck. It was an original, original tank carrier out of from the Second World War. And the only real change they made to it was to take it from left-hand drive to right-hand. And uh, oh, it, it'd pull anything as long as you could keep the back wheels on the ground. It had a Hercules motor. The transmission was a four-speed. But it had a joey box. Yeah, joey. Yeah, with another three. Life in the mine was hard before the safety regimes that we find in mines today were implemented. I've seen a few blokes killed here. Some bad accidents. How did but, they happen? Oh, there's a rod mill, a two mill, and there's a, the blokes go in to, to straighten the rods up after they're loaded in there. And uh, I won't, I won't mention names, but the no. ship boys come along and pushed the, pushed the buttons, thinking it should be going, and there was still one bloke in, left in there. And God. it turned one and a half times, and when they pulled him out, he never had a bone left in his. Yeah. In his body. The copper and gold extracted from the living rock of Mount Morgan came at a high human cost. There's been a few trucks go over the dumps and that, but I was never in them, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> millions and millions of dollars worth of metal was pulled from these hills. I know there's 14 tonne of gold come out of the tailings when they did put the tailings back through. 14 tonnes of gold. That's half a million ounces worth at today's rate, $800 million. And that was just from the tailings dam. In the 70s and 80s, problems had to be sorted out as they arose, like getting this power shovel to a lower level in the open cut pit. It's hooked up by cables and pulleys and a lot of hard work and pushed over the edge. And down it goes till it reaches its final level. Ken Reed is active with his many interests but he is vitally interested in preserving the stories when Mount Morgan Mine was king of the mountain. Next, we'll follow in the steps of explorer John McDowell Stewart, right to the heart of our nation. Explorer John McDowell Stewart, after six attempts, crossed the country from the south to north. Driving up the Stewart Highway today on this fine seal two-laner, you look out across a beautiful but desolate landscape. A vista of saltbush and runt mallee that changes to give a desert country. In the climate-controlled environment of a modern truck, the journey is a breeze. Look out into that dry, arid landscape and one question comes to mind. How did those old fellas do it? The highway today pretty much follows Stewart's tracks. I, I guess that's why it's called the Stewart Highway. This trip started out and ended as a road test of the latest cat truck, the CT630 LS. The LS stands for Luxury Sleeper. It's powered by the Cat C15 engine, now upgraded to meet ADR8003 or Euro 5 standards, more or less. With the truck fueled up, I wheel it out of a servo at Bolivar on Adelaide's northern side. On the 23rd of October in 1861, Stuart and his men left from a place near here and punched out through South Australia's pastoral lands. 
In 2012, we swing along, northbound with Adelaide Sunday traffic on the undulating pools. Through the green expanses of South Australia's winter broadacre crops. The CT 630 LS was launched at the Melbourne Truck Show earlier this year, impressive in its carbon fibre cladding. The road test was something of a production number, with a cat truck support vehicle and a crew of three. General Manager of Sales and Marketing for Cat Trucks, Australia and New Zealand, Jeff Tyzak, National PR Manager, Glenn Sharman, and Contract Driver, Renee Buman. At a truck stop, Cat Trucks head honcho, Jeff Tyzak, had a chance to tell me a bit about the truck. Started life as one of the ADR Radio 2, two vehicles we built back in 2010, and um, we decided that um, we wanted to to work, put some work into a, uh, a big luxury sleeper, the CT630 LS. So our local engineers, we, we basically took one of our ADR Radio 2 trucks and uh, we lifted the cab off and we've got the, the, the new cab, the, the LS cabin, and we've dropped it on top of the, the frame. We've done all the, the chassis work required for that. And at the same time, we've um, done all the um, conversions for the ADR Radio 3 engine. Luxury cab and luxury trip. We stop to camp each night. So head into Port Augusta for our first stop. And unhook the trailers at the road train pad. Before daylight we hook the trailers up once more. And with the pre-trip check completed. Uh, today we're driving to Coober Pedy. So nothing left to do but uh, get on the road. With the speed limit now increased to 100 kilometres an hour, the distance peels away beneath the cat. As most people know, Caterpillar pulled their engines off the automotive or truck market some years ago. This led to an Australian joint venture between Caterpillar and US truck builder Navistar. But things have changed there too over the past year. NC Squared uh, obviously was initially set up as a, a joint venture, so 50% owned by Caterpillar and 50% owned by Navistar. Then the, the decision was made that um, Navistar would buy Caterpillar's share of the business, so now we as NC Squared in Australia are a wholly owned, so 100% wholly owned subsidiary of, of Navistar in the US. The double bite of the Pimber Hills are probably the steepest pulls on the South Road. On the first climb I change half a gear at 1400 revs and keep it going, go a full gear when it comes back to 1350. The taco drops below 1300 and I do another shift and split to 14th. The truck pulls over the top in 14th. The second pull was the same, 14th gear. 79 tonnes, not bad. From the Pimber Hills is just a spit in the hollow into Spud's Roadhouse and time for a cuppa. So we're at Pimber, we've just had 150, 160k run up from Port Augusta and uh, I got, I got to say, uh, at, at the outset, it's a, it's a damn nice little truck to drive. Check how's the morning going? Yeah, no, nice coffee. Beautiful, beautiful sunshine. Good company, good people, good country. Lovely. Good truck as well. Oh, yeah. 
The run to Cooper PD is close to 400 kilometres through the day. Still winter officially, but the day warms and the desert sky is chromed with a white glare, an early hint of a fast approaching summer. I gaze out over the landscape. I'm at home here, spent a chunk of my life in and around deserts. But looking at the country we're driving through, you can't help but feel for the old pioneers like Stuart's party travelling through this parched landscape. The sun dips towards the horizon as I turn the road train into Cuba Pedy. Cooper Petty. Half a day's work I suppose, 550 kilometres since we left Port Augusta this morning and uh, yeah, yeah, interesting day. We have a chance to take the CT630 LS for a run through the Cooper moonscape and try it out on unsealed roads. Along dusty dirt roads pockmarked with oval diggings. Blowers, those drums on long arms on the back of trucks for the extraction of the precious stones, tell of riches being pulled from the living rock. Pulling two trailers, the LS was at home in this strange place, where holes had been dug over and over, chasing a lose of wealth and the chance of striking it big. Cuba PD. This strange town of opals and tourists is quiet in the half hour before daylight as we make our way to the truck. So we're in Cuba PD, heading for Alice Springs today. It's a bit chilly down here. Breakfast at Cadney. Looking forward to it. Many visitors to this outback landscape see, well, nothing, or so they say. To me, the country is forever changing, and again, north of Cuba, it's almost on fire in the morning sun. We're, we're driving through a, an amazing Australian landscape. It's, uh, just to be driving through this is uh, so... It's like a massage on your brain just to be out here. A cold morning on the road makes you hungry, probably for the wrong kind of food. So we stop at Cadney Roadhouse on Mount Willoughby Station. And with the cat truck's crew, we sample the best. 
territory border. territory border. Crossing back into the territory is always a moment for me. Coming home. Yeah, right, it's pretty good, mate. Uh, it's all fed day, but it's pretty cool for a couple of hundred. Yeah, mate. Good, good run your way. It's a 4.6 metre wide load, no worries at all. And, uh, I'll catch you later, eh? Have a good one. Lunchtime. Feels like we just had breakfast. Anyway, we'll have a look. Renee Buman is a contract driver working on a freelance basis with Cat Trucks, steering trucks around Australia, getting equipment to shows and events, and most recently shuttling the Cat Road train back and forth for media test drives between Alice Springs and Adelaide. He's pretty proud of how the CT630 is set up. Very easy to lift. So has it sprung? It's got a gas strut in there. And when we look under the bonnet here, the motor looks like it's behind a few, you know, ancillary, bits of ancillary equipment, but this guard here comes off, just a couple of bolts, and the whole thing comes out, and you can walk in and access the motor. Underneath the, this air filter is the new emission control system where the, uh, the breather goes back into the sump. That's one of the things we had to do to meet the new ADR 803 emission standard. Everything's really accessible here. The dipstick's right there. It's good. We can also see the air filter marker on the front of the air filter. Oil filler. All your things you need to check water coolant, wiper fluid, etc, clutch fluid, it's all very accessible. And again, this side, a couple of bolts, this whole guard comes off and you can walk in and service the engine. Rene was involved with the certification of the C15. The, uh, the main thing we had to do to meet the new emission standard is down the back of the truck. We've gone from a single exhaust system to a dual exhaust system to allow the truck to breathe, the truck engine to breathe a little more. Then we've stuck a couple of DPFs, particulate filters, in that exhaust system. They catch the soot and the soot is burnt off just by the exhaust temperature of the coming down from the engine. So it's a very simple system. There's no EGR, there's no SCR, there's no replacement of DPFs for the life of the engine. It's just a very simple, put the key in and drive, emission standard engine. 
I cruised past Earl Dunder. It was only a couple of weeks ago I met my old mate Lindsay here. Through the desert oaks. To me the landscape sings through here, a magnificent landscape. And it is a fine thing to think that other than a thin strip of bitumen running through it, we can look out on a vista that has remained the same for perhaps thousands of years. The launch of cat trucks in Australia nearly two years ago is now history and the company is looking at expanding the product line. The certification of the CAT C15 engine to meet ADR8003 emission standards is the ace in CAT trucks hands and without doubt the company will be capitalising on the historic popularity of the 15 litre engine. Across the Fink River There's a bit of road work happening throughout the Territory. Truck parking bays are being put in. There's a concern that these rest areas are heralding the imposition of logbooks for Territory truckies. <coughs> Back to human folly and past the Cannonball Run monument. We run into the outliers of McDonnell Ranges, through low hills and sweeping bends. And into Alice Springs, the end of the South Road, as we swing onto the road between the airport and town. Late in the afternoon, we drive through Heavy Tree Gap. around the roundabout. And we're heading into Alice. And traffic. And traffic lights. past the joys of modern living, the fast food outlets. The traffic and lights are a bit of a shock after three days of crossing half a nation through the great Australian loneliness. Out through the racecourse area. Always have things Cost me thousands of dollars. <laughs> and park up at the Shell truck stop on the northern side of town. We fuel up and the cat truck drinks 1,100 litres of diesel and has brought us 1,515 kilometres. I drop the keys into Renee's hands. Great trip. He has to run the truck back to Melbourne, where apparently it will be pulled to pieces and analysed. The CT630 LS was a prototype, and the Cat Trucks team is keen on making it right. For me, I'd have been very happy to keep going all the way to Darwin, as Stuart did on his sixth attempt. Today, a score or more of trucks leave Adelaide every day, heading north along the Stuart Highway, following the tracks of Stuart. I'm sure most drivers occasionally look out across that desert landscape and perhaps, like me, think, how did he do it?